on this week in sales, we're going to be taking a look at intelligent sales demo automation, how only 24% of salespeople are high performers. And we say goodbye. We say bye-bye to trade shows. Welcome to This Week in Sales, hosted by myself, Will Barron, and the legend that is Victor Antonio. Victor, how's it going, sir? Well, I'm glad to be here this week. I just want to formally apologize on video that I, I let you down last week. But again, you had to see me trying to get internet in that hotel. It just was horrible. It wasn't working. So I do apologize. We were filming a, um, a two-day virtual event that's going to be produced and shown in January. So that's always a, a quite an experience to go through that. But it was all good. How about yourself? How, what's you doing on your world? Um, not much is all that new. I've got to be honest. Just the usual grind. We, if the audience will see an, another camera, that took me three days to set up and uh, try to increase the production value of the content we're doing. A separate camera. That was a complete faff. But yeah, Victor, I'm, I'm glad to have you back on, mate. And let me ask you this. Do you ever, because you do a lot more traveling than I do, and, and there's the opportunity for some behind-the-scenes content of Victor Antonio running around a hotel trying to get signal. Do you ever do any kind of behind-the-scenes or a vlog, video blog content? Because I think that's uh, that'd be really interesting to see. I think I took a small clip. Somebody was asking me, where are you at? Chris Stone, who produces my show, The Sales Influence Podcast, and I just sent them a little behind-the-scenes. And so maybe we'll show it on the next one. It's like it's like a 30 second clip if you want to see it. It's it's you know, it's just a lot of cameras, big production stage, the whole bit, and me just trying to get ready. That's about it. <laughs> do you do well, anything? I wearing a mask, by the way. Do you do anything, Victor, to get ready? Do you have like a Tony Robbins routine where like you you're banging your chest and, and running around screaming or anything like that? No, you know what I have to do, Will? I have to do like um voice exercises. And so it's a real simple one, too, but it's a real simple. What happened was I was losing my voice on stage. It's like my 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 larynx, my my my, my throat was tightening up and I, nothing was coming out. And so I went to see a throat specialist because I thought I had polyps in my throat on my voice box. Wasn't it? He says, No, I said you're breathing wrong. I said, What do you mean? He says, What's happening is you're pushing you're you're breathing from your chest, not from your stomach, and you're pushing, you're forcing air through your chest. So he made me do this exercise before I go on stage. So here's my routine. It's just simply says, say these words. Right before you go on stage. I mean, don't say them out loud. Sometimes you say, he says, say the words like noon, right? The whole noon, moon, soon. And what happens is it gently vibrates your cords. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. almost like warms them up. He says, clearing your throat, like doing this, <clears throat> is like slapping your vocal cords. You don't want to do that before you speak. So that's my routine. You'll hear, you'll hear me say noon, moon, <laughs> before I go on. That's it. There's Amazing my secret stuff. revealed. Well, there's a <laughs> the top sales hack for anyone, because it probably works if it's the first phone call of the day, right? Uh, I know I sound a bit grouchy. I probably sound a little bit grouchy right now because I've done a load of content this week. My voice is a little bit sore. Um, so yeah, that, that maybe, is that how I get the, the deep, sexy Victor Antonio voice by doing these exercises? I think that might be a way to do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into the news before this gets weird. Right, Salesforce have a state of sales report. Now, there is 50, 100 different metrics and data points that came from this report. I pulled out a few, and so I'm going to throw a couple of these at you, Victor. And interestingly, um, or this may be interesting uh, for some of the the audience, I, I know your background is in engineering. I'm a published, somehow, I'm a published scientist. My name is in the, the Journal of Computation Chemistry, com Computational Chemistry. Uh, so I appreciate good uh, science and scientific method. So... And, and I've never seen this in a study before, a sales study. Salesforce very specifically talked about that they uh, surveyed 6,000 sales professionals. It was a double blind survey that they put out. And then they list out another a few uh, things that uh, made this study more valuable or not necessarily more valuable, more valid than some of the other studies that I've seen in the past. And some of the key findings. So let me, let me throw these three numbers at you, Victor, and we'll get your feedback. 68% of sales people are moderate performers. 9% are underperformers, and 24% Salesforce, this study shows, are high performers. Now, are those numbers what you expected? Because whenever I look at any content about salespeople that isn't for salespeople, it's always banging on about salespeople, everyone misses the target. 50% of salespeople miss the target. There's, there's these issues, there's these issues. But if 68% are moderate performers, moderate must mean are doing fine, are doing appropriately, and 24% are mm -hmm. high performers. That seems like pretty outstanding numbers for a whole industry. 
I think so. I've always used the 20-60-20 rule. 20 top performers, 60 in the middle, 20 in the bottom. And so the only thing that's shocking here is how many people are actually in the middle. So we don't know how they range that. So that was the only thing that stood out to me. The high performer, 24%, doesn't really surprise me. But I'm wondering, well, that 68%, because we hear what it was, CSO Insights always talking about, you know, 50% of salespeople, whatever the number is this year, uh, don't hit quota, achieve or exceed their quota. So that 68% are those people who did good, like maybe they achieved 80% or 90% of quota, moderate success, then this would make sense if that's kind of what they're talking about. Yeah. So I think this is a, it's a survey. It was done with salespeople, uh, sales leaders, sales directors, VPs. Mm -hmm. It was asking them, the out of the individuals on their team who is quote a moderate performer so if they know whether they share it or not that all the targets are way off and the team are actually doing really well and revenue is up year on year then that would add to that uh, group of moderate performers i i, I guess yeah i think i think i would have the metric in my head if you're 80 percent of quota you're a moderate performer sure you know i would just use that number but i think the 24 percent is you hit your number and you exceeded your number yeah, I, I think that's Good incredible. Fun. And this data came from a survey that was done between May and June. So I guess just as all of the, the COVID uh, stuff was kicking off across, uh, maybe it hit Europe at this point and it was kind of just building steam in the US. So that will all affect these numbers if the survey was redone right now. Um, yeah. Another couple yeah, of... Yeah, because I think it's... By the way, so sure. I wanted to ask, I mean, th these numbers are going to be totally distorted going forward, I think. You know what I mean? If they were to do the same survey in the next, let's say, over the last three or four months, because the, you know, it's sales has changed so much. We know this already. But how many people are actually really selling and how many people are just having stuff land in their lap? Sure. You know, because the demand is there. Like Zoom would be one example. Netflix, companies like that where stuff is just falling. The pool companies, the pest control industry where, I mean, sales are just coming in. So there's going to be some distortion in data. For sure, uh, we had Ed on, he's a VP sales of uh, of HubSpot, I had him on the Salesman podcast, and he made a really good point. I'd never thought about it like this before. So clearly we, we're in a recession economically via, I think a recession is uh, when GDP is down over three um, quarters in a row. Consecutive quarters. Sure. Correct. So we are in that. We we match that criteria. But what Ed shared with me, and I, I never, never thought about it like this before, I never comprehended it, was that it's somewhat artificial because a true recession most of the time hits pretty much the whole marketplace. Whereas this has hit, for example, airlines way harder and and uh, retail and hotels and, and those kind of industries has hit way harder than you know, probably your business and my business. This is the best year we've ever had um, for, from our perspective. And so it's a, it's a weird artificial recession. So some of the numbers and the data points are going to be skewed and, and, and weird all over the place by, yes. by that alone. That's a, that's a great add-on. I, I think that's a better articulation of what my brain was trying to articulate, that it's going to be distorted. It's almost like I like the whole selective recession thing. Mm. You know, certain markets are going to go into recession, certain aren't. So, yeah, that's the distortion. So that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And Kudos to Hubs. And another, another point from HubSpot as well, I, I covered this last week on the, I think they call it the sa recent sales enablement support, uh, report. They covered England, uh, the UK, and they found that 40% of uh, salespeople in London are uncertain if they are going to hit their sales target this year. But outside of London, that number dropped down to, I'm going to butcher it slightly, I'll include the link in the show notes of this episode uh, for the report, but it was something like 27%. So people in London and this must be the companies that are in London based versus companies that are outside of London. Um, maybe there's more technology companies, but whatever it is. They are, you know, the people outside of London are more certain of hitting their targets this year. So it just shows how artificial all of this is and, and how even location dependent it is. That is interesting. We'd love to see how that data rolls out. You know, if they would ever do a study on that, why inside of London versus outside of London, why the difference in perspective? Interesting. <laughs> right. Uh, maybe so more, more pints. Maybe there's more pints in reality in the UK, in London, than there is outside of London. Could that be it? Could, we could do a pint correlation here, <laughs> beer correlation. More alcohol abuse in London than outside. <laughs> the, the data's probably there. There's probably the data. <laughs> now, whether there's uh, whether correlation uh, equals causation is another conversation to have. That is correct. Yeah. Um, but going back to this Salesforce study, uh, another thing, uh, the master of AI in sales, Victor Antonio, thought this would be interesting for you. Sales teams using AI have increased from... 21% in 2018, uh, two in 2018, 
to 37% in 2020. So also on top of that, that, that seems pretty obvious, right? Every tool now has some kind of AI machine learning thing tacked onto the side of it, the top of it and the bottom of it, even if it's just a marketing ploy as opposed to being useful. But what I thought was really interesting was high performing salespeople are 2.8 times more likely to use AI than mediocre performing individuals. So That's how much data. how much of success of a high performing salesperson comes from the tools that they're using? Yeah, I mean, I, by the way, the first point is interesting because everything has AI, as you rightly pointed out, correct? Uh, I remember, uh, I love the phrase by Kevin Kelly, who uh, was one of the founders of Wired Magazine, when he said that in order to understand AI or to think about AI, think about it as electricity. It's going to be in everything. You won't see it, but it's in everything. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is absolutely right. Whether it's used or not, it's in everything, or it's going to be in everything. And people who use the data are going to be more reliant on better data instead of their gut instincts. So it doesn't surprise me, I think, but that's uh, 2.8x more likely to use AI. That's a good trend in my book. That's a good trend that people are going to start using the systems more. And maybe this is what we need, Will. You know how in the past, you know, CRMs were always like, you know, uh, you know, Big Brother had this Orwellian taint to it. <laughs> and maybe people start seeing it as an enablement tool because, you know, you know, it isn't until everybody else starts using it and starts succeeding that you go, hmm, maybe there is something to this AI thing. I should look into this. And so maybe this will create that wave of uh, adoption that we've been looking for. Sure. And we'll come on to that very point uh, later on when we talk about Chorus, because um, they're doing some cool stuff with AI that makes CRMs more useful as well. Next couple of points. We don't need to run through all of these. Um, I don't want to labor the point of this report or the 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 emphasis of this report. But there was something here uh, which I think is relevant for you, I, and probably everyone who's listening to this. 63% of sales professionals are confident in their organization's ability to train forward slash retrain them. Now, that That's number shocking. shocked me. That's yeah. shocking. Yeah. I was like, what? I was like, that was like, because we usually sales people are always complaining. I don't get the training I need to be successful. Wow. All right. So, so is that number. shocking because Plus you think that number is high or is it shocking because you think the number is low? I think that number is high. I think that number is like too high. So so sales professionals are confident and they're, or, because I hear sales professionals complain that they don't get enough training. So I believe that number is way high. I disagree with Salesforce. I don't care how big they are. So I would say <laughs> it's low. I, I was shocked that it was so high because if I worked really? for an organization – that I, I had to use the, the language here that I was not confident in their ability to train or retrain me, I'd be out of there because that's a huge part of getting better at sales, right? Clearly, we can all spend our own money and our own time and resources reading books, doing training. You've got you know the excellent uh, training that you have uh, that you're going to do uh, both via YouTube and, and the paid training and um, uh, memberships and stuff as well. But with the organization that you're working for, if I'm not confident that they have the ability to train me, I'm in the wrong organization. I need to be at their competitor. So that number was a shocker to me that it wasn't 80 or 90%. Because again, if I was in an organization that I was not confident mm -hmm. were able to train me, I'd be out of there in a, in a heartbeat. Right. I mean, there, there is a correlation. I mean, your point is well taken. There is a correlation between, you know, uh, employer retention and training, especially in sales, right? If you don't have the sales training program, I'm out of here, as you pointed out. <clears throat> maybe, maybe where I'm shocked is that maybe we need to slice and dice this a little bit. I wonder if these are enterprise companies as opposed to small, medium-sized businesses. Like maybe there's a level of revenue that certain companies achieve. Like if it's over a $100 million company, more likely to have training than not, right? Anything less than $50 million, uh, they're not likely to have their own training program. They're still trying to scale their business. So maybe that's where our our, our our disconnect comes in, our two different points of view. We need more. We need more. I think Salesforce failed us on giving us more detail. Will's uh, looking it up right I'm, now. I'm Will's looking like, it up really? right now. <laughs> uh, so Let's they break it. Has their act together. There we go. So they break it down by company size. So 16% of the data was from small companies, 21 to 100 employees. 56% was from medium-sized organizations, 101 employees to 3,500, and 28% was from uh, enterprise organizations. So a third was from organizations with more than 3,500 employees. And and to be fair, 
I, I've only ever worked for huge billion dollar organizations. I've never worked for a startup. I've never worked for even a medium sized company. So my expectations of training perhaps uh, perhaps is, is skewed towards the fact that if it's, if it's not the provided for me, there's an issue. And maybe that is not normal for companies that are, as you kind of point out, Victor, maybe that's not normal for companies that are of a smaller size. Yeah, I think so. And maybe my uh, experience perspective is skewed towards that because the majority of my customer, I'll say they're more medium-sized businesses, not large enterprise businesses. And maybe sure. that's where my perspective is a little skewed on what I see. So yeah, I mean, if we split the data law, if you look at these numbers, 16%, 56%, 28%, yeah, we can start making the argument that where some of the numbers come in. Okay, cool. I get it. And um, one last one, because I don't want the, the audience to just be <clears throat> fatigued by numbers here, uh, but I thought this was fascinating as well. 72% of salespeople say that they've been, quote, productive from home during the COVID pandemic. So that seems like a massive win for organizations who are shifting to this remote selling um, way of doing things. But 48% of these individuals say that they were less productive than what they used to be. So they are still productive, they're still doing work, but they are less productive than when they were, I guess, in an office environment or in a field sales environment. I, I, I actually I actually understand that paradox. Yep. I get that paradox. I mean, it's like I said, I'm being more productive at home, but there I'm less productive than I used to be. And it's almost like you're it's just the activity balance sheet has changed. You know, and so I get that. I don't know why. It's we- it sounds weird, but I get it. I get it. Yeah. And look, it By makes sense. If, if in an office environment, you are a nine out of 10 because Barry is over your shoulder, the sales manager, making sure that you're doing everything in time and you come out of the office and you're just knackered and fatigued and you hate your job and you work from home and you're a seven out of 10, you're still productive and you might be having better work-life balance. It might be a better position for you to be uh, for employers to put you in I, i'm making all these numbers up obviously but that might be you might end up being a longer term employee you might be more happy you might have better sales results because you're not miserable on the phone so th- there's all kinds of variables here that we could uh, allude to and, and without the actual data to show but i just thought that was interesting that it doesn't necessarily mean that really salespeople. yeah it doesn't necessarily mean sales people less effective if they're slightly less productive but there's one thing I'm not clear on what you just said, though. Okay. What does knackered mean? I thought <laughs> knackered was, was a drunk. Is that, what, what does knackered mean? That, you know, what does that mean? I feel like we need a segment each week where Victor questions my Queen's English. And we can have some background music. We can have, uh, what, we can have the Beatles in the background. So right now we have this great graphic, yeah. Macker. Right now, uh, behind me, uh, uh, Union Jack like flops down to the floor. It's, like, it's all rippling and uh, the, the national anthem starts playing. Uh, knackered just means, uh, so in that context, knackered would mean tired. If I'm, na- at the end of today, I will be absolutely shattered or I'll be absolutely knackered because I've got a long day ahead of me, a lot, lots of work. So that, that's what it means. But if I if I visit the local pub and I've had one too many, am I knackered also? Mm, no, you would be blooded. Blooded. Okay. <laughs> now, if someone kicks you in the nuts, they've also kicked you in the knackers. Right, okay. So uh, <laughs> as, as I'm saying this, maybe it isn't the easiest thing to uh, understand Northern English. What's funny though is, way. what's funny, you call me out on it. I do, I've done 700 episodes of the podcast, right? With different guests from all over the world. And nobody ever calls me out on any of this. Maybe they're just too polite. So half the audience listening, because I don't get called out on it live when I'm recording, probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So you're doing the audience a service here, Victor. I, I think so. I, I, I'm providing the translation. <laughs> May I continue, Will? May I continue? Let's go for it. So let's look at some sales tools and technology. Now, I came across this company called, uh, it's called goconsensus.com. And it's the phrase intelligent demo automation. It, and I thought that was just an interesting phrase. The latest research makes it clear, by the way, who should be really paying attention right now? If you're doing demos <clears throat> and you're spending a lot of time doing not only the demo, but doing multiple demos to one client with multiple uh, stakeholders, this is for you. Latest research makes it clear that the B2B buying process has become too complex and difficult and buyers today to crave companies that experience ex- and crave companies and experienced guys who help make the process easier. Focus on making the buying easier and your prospects will buy from you faster. So sales teams can shorten their sales cycle by as much as 
68%. Now, the reason I, I – this stopped me right here because usually you don't have a lot of conversations about shortening sales cycles. I thought it was interesting. When they learn how to equip their champion, the people promoting their solutions inside the target account. And so this company, Go Consensus, basically creates these in, helps you create intelligent demo automations, which are you know things that you can just automate to different stakeholders. And the whole thing is that you want to give your champion, or as the challenger people would call it, the mobilizer within the company, to go forward with the right tools to battle the sea level dragons. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on this is I'm going to throw right back at you. Should demos be done by a someone who's in customer success or customer service rather than as a, a function of sales? And I, I guess a, a layer on top of that is should demos be done in a way where a potential buyer could just watch a YouTube video? Should it be so non-pressured and so non-salesy that they feel so comfortable just jumping on a demo, having a conversation and don't feel any obligation to move forward until they're ready? Because I feel like we could pull in two different ways here. Automation, we could get even more salesy and, and customize things so specifically that at the end of the conversation, we go, hey, does this make sense to move forward with this immediately? You've seen everything. Or we could use it to tool customer service, customer success individuals to do some of this role, perhaps taking some of the burden off demos from uh, the, the quote unquote closers within or the account managers within an organization. Well, the answer is all the above, not a cop-out answer. Here's what I mean by it, is that one of the things they talk about is creating different demos for different stakeholders, like the CMO, the CSO, and everybody, right? But also another layer to this was they came up with six types of demos that you should do. Like there's the vision demo. Here's a vision of how this would help your company. Maybe a C-level person would want to see that. Then there's the how do I use this for this specific, and that demo can be like 15 minutes. So all these demos have various lengths, but also are very targeted. And what I also liked about this company is that it, it has this phrase called demo lytics, which means that when it sends out the demos and the champion re, you know, pushes the demos, or again, it goes through email, social media, is that they're tracking all the interactions with the different stakeholders in the company, and they're used, they could use those analytics to kind of also add to the pot of AI data to say, hmm, I think this might be a good prospect to really pursue and qualify. What is the difference to, between, um, I, clearly you don't work for the organization, but I'm going to ask you the question mm -hmm. anyway. What's the difference between a vision demo and a vision presentation? So oh, the vision demo is you don't have to be there. I'm giving it to you, my champion. So you're, you're my guy inside the company. Here's the problem. Well, I go to you and you're like, Victor, great product. What do you got? Right. And then you're going to have to turn around and upsell it. Now, you're not going to be able to articulate my message the way I would. And then the other error we commit with our champion is to say, OK, just show everybody, you know, this demo, this video. But then different stakeholders require different videos. So it's almost like you have to equip your champion with quivers. You know, you know, arrows in their quiver to say, okay, for this one, use this video. For this one, operations, use this video. For this one, use that video. And what we're trying to do, I guess, is get the champion to get all these people in the room to do the bigger demo, at least grab their interest and get a bigger demo. Okay, that makes total sense. A qu <laughs> quite an aggressive analogy, though. Go, here's some, uh, here's a bolt and a crossbow. <laughs> I want you to shoot these individuals with this one and shoot these individuals yeah. with the other. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought. I, I thought it's an interesting company. I will talk about the, 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 the founder who wrote a book uh, in a, a little later, but I thought this was interesting because not a lot of people are addressing automating demos. I'm not talking about pre-recorded. They're pre-recorded to an extent. By the way, they're also interactive. I ha forgot to highlight that, which means that somewhere in the demo, you can go, go this way, go that way, and it'll move th through the demo. So you'll be able to use this company to actually build your demos. That's, that's the truth. It seems like uh, we could swap the word demo there with uh, interactive training or because uh, uh, a lot of training uses these frameworks, right? Of if you get the question right, you move forward. If you don't get it, if you get it wrong, you go this way and you can build decision trees into it as well. So it seems like we're almost training individuals. You, we're using leveraging someone to train the individuals on what the product does, features, benefits, that side of things within the organization without us having to physically be there, whether it's because we can't physically be there because of COVID, 
whether it is because we just don't have access to these individuals or maybe it comes a lot of the time it comes across better from the individual within the account. I know when I was in medical device sales, I'd do the same thing. I would give, I'd just physically give the surgeons my presentations that I'd given to them. And then they would take it and then translate it into bureaucratic NHS spiel here in the UK at a far higher level, especially if they were then on upselling things on my behalf to a chief medical officer within a hospital trust or something like that. They could communicate on, I try my best, but they would communicate on a higher level uh, with medical terminology and the, the benefits, uh, ongoing patient benefits of different products and things. So sounds amazing. Yeah. No, by the, by the way, I like to reframe on that because it is somewhat like interactive training. It's just being very specific on a product. So I like that. Cool. Well, go. talking about training, Aligo has, I'm going to quote here, expanded sales learning and enablement uh, market leadership with the acquisition of Refract. Refract is a, a British company, so it's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this. Now, it's interesting because we've kind of touched on this in the past of uh, acquisitions of different market segments. And we, we talked about in the past whether CRM companies should buy sales trading companies so they can add another element of value to the uh, potential buyers. So Aligo, um, and again, I'm quoting here, transforms your organization with mobile interactive learning and enablement technology. Refract, who they've just bought, analyzes sales calls and demos and profiles, revenue defining moments, revealing what leads to successful outcomes. So it seems like a two separate businesses. And what I, I don't know this for a fact, it seems like though, they can use the data from Refract if they have a customer using that to then create training on the back of, hey, your reps, of uh, uh, missing uh, uh, missing pricing questions. Your reps, because they're recording the calls, transcribing them and pulling data from them. Your reps are, calls are ending early when your reps say this. Calls are ending early when people do that. When there's three people in the conversation, you, you have better outcomes. And so a sales enablement, and I guess it's almost like a training company, but a sales enablement company that does software that enables you to train your organization. If they've got all that data, they can then use sales enablement much more specifically, rather than on a hunch or on a couple of sales managers listening back to a couple of pieces of call, a couple of calls every now and again to to predict what they think the team needs, they can do it on uh, thousands of calls and, and pull real data into this. Now, I might be making all of this up, Victor, because the press release didn't say any of what I just <laughs> well, said. It's a great story, it's a, <laughs> but it, it makes total sense what you're yep. saying. It kind of yep. like so on the outside looking in, it makes total sense. It's like you know we're a training company. Uh, we need more data to see what's going on. Let's see if we can use this tool. Because I imagine, is it Aligo? What do you say? Aligo? How do you say that? I would say Aligo. Aligo. So, you know, Aligo says they're, they're expanding sales learning and they have market leadership, right? They want to be in the front market. So they're doing a lot of self-learning and enablement. And they can't go out and buy a gong. Can't do that. Too big, right? So they're finding these small players because they want that capability instead of building it themselves. So it makes total sense. I mean, I thought your summary is good. Good. And as I said, I've got no insights to this. I've spoke to a couple of the guys over at Refract over the years of different projects and different things. They seem like a nice bunch. So congratulations on the acquisition, guys. And uh, hopefully I'm not too far off with uh, with the, the the way things uh, kind of may go with Aligo, the, the, the buying company. Aligo. And by the way, uh, if uh, Will's wrong, let him know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, Will. Bye-bye trade shows. B2B trade shows won't recover for years, my friend. Let me just hit you with that title, your initial reactions when you saw that title. My initial reaction is I don't care. Um, you, know, <laughs> no, I, you know, I appreciate there'll be people listening to the show now. I know there's at least one company in the UK who do a whole bunch, a whole series of different B2B trade shows who clearly have just been obliterated right now. And they're all the, the their revenue is from advertisers. No show, no advertisers. And so I feel I feel the pain from a business perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective. I don't want to go to trade shows. I don't want to be in a crowd in, in with people who are, you know. So and I'll give you more context. My experience has always been uh, large um, gynecology trade shows, large uh, urology trade shows. And I've always been the the mug on the stage giving talks or demoing, demoing equipment and me hey, not with... Way, I just, I just, want, to inter I just want to interrupt that. I personally wouldn't want to go to a gynecology or urology trade <laughs> show either. I'm just letting you know. 
So well, go ahead. But you're two, the, the, two horrible examples, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> you know, willies and vaginas are big money in medical devices. Um, I mean, you could have said something like the Consumer Electronics Show. You could have said something. You so that's different, so though. Many things. So, so CES, right, has a uh, consumer right. element to it. So it would be a cool. So I would go to that. That'd be a cool thing to go to to check out all this new technology and and to even interact and mingle with really bright people in in that space that you'd never get a chance to mingle with. Now, the behind the scenes of CES, there's clearly there's loads of deals being done. Manufacturers are getting together. I want to build a laptop, so I'm going to speak to this person, this person, a screen manufacturer, hard drive manufacturer, and see what we can put together. So it's, it's, a, it's a meeting, it's an opportunity to do networking and meeting there. Um, so I would go to a consumer trade show. That could be really interesting. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a golden retriever in a few months. I would go to a golden a retriever. I Come. I just want to know, are you saying that urologists don't get together and say, oh, that's a cool tool, and then later on cut some deals on how do we manufacture and work on this cool tool? I think they do. Um, okay, and again, I'm giving it from the perspective of I'm a salesperson on the ground at these events speaking to urologists. And look, most of the engagement I would have with these surgeons, right, is, hey, come and see us at the trade booth. Make me look good in front of me, boss. Don't Don't make me look stupid. And we'll go out for a drink later on. That you know, that's that's the reality of it. Um, I knew some of the customers that I deal with. It was a bit. It's certain. Uh, for example, gynecology was less so. Um, uh, colorectal surgery was more so. Some of these were a bit more like a, of an old boys' club. So you'd go and you know go and have a few pints and smoke a cigar with these individuals, and orders would come in on the back of it. And you know, other groups of individuals and other trade shows would be less likely, less like that. So I guess I'm coming at this from the perspective of being the the dude in the suit or the woman in the the outfit, whatever it is, being on stage at these events, being the salesperson. I've not got experience coming from the consumer side, in which case they might be really valuable, but I'm not sure how valuable they really are. Yeah, I, I mean, I I went to many trade shows. Like I came from the, obviously the technology side, so I. I know exactly what you're talking about. But here's what's interesting. Like, let me just read this because it's interesting. Live events like trade shows and conferences have traditionally ranked as one of the top sources of leads. But that all but dissolved in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. The event industry is a shell of its former self, according to a piece of marketing charts citing data from uh, PricewaterhouseCooper. So PwC estimates that the U.S. trade show market will be cut in size by almost two-thirds. And then these numbers were a little shocking. The consulting firm says live events, conferences, and trade shows have shrunk 64%, not shocking there yet, as an industry. But in less than a year, it dropped from roughly a $16 billion market in 2019 to about $6 billion today. That's huge. I mean, when you say two-thirds, you're like, oh, that's a lot. But when you go 16 to $6 billion, you're like, dang, that's a lot. You know, so... But what this data feel, isn't um, going into is there might be four billion worth of online conferences, events, things that have taken its place, and that most of this money is coming from sponsorships, right? Of and um, and people paying for a booth in a specific location. And so I'm not saying that that money has been totally made up. Clearly, it hasn't. But there's different, definitely different revenue uh, places for revenue to come from. And look, let's talk about our friends over at Sales Hacker. Four or five years ago is when I first started doing the podcast. They were absolutely crushing it with different conferences, San Francisco, London, uh, all over the place. And that market basically fell apart because why would Outreach, for example, linked to a sales hacker, our friend Max, why would they pay 20 grand for a booth at a sales hacker event when they can just put on their own event and they own it and there's not any competitors there? And I believe that's what happened to that, that market. A lot of companies would put on these events for their customers. And obviously you have the the beasts like uh, HubSpot do inbound. I think Michelle Obama spoke there was the keynote speaker a few years ago and Salesforce have uh, Dreamforce. It was just, just the whole of San Francisco shuts down for a week for this uh, your conference, but it's not really a conference. What did, what did, what did, what did, what did she talk about there? Um, like, I don't I, know. I'm having a hard time seeing her at Dreamforce. Like, what did she talk about? I mean, she had the book Believe, right? Let me... Maybe they just need somebody inspirational. Maybe that's what they need. That, that's interesting. But anyway, as you're looking that up, uh, I, I I think your 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 perspective is, is well placed. That a lot of the stuff may you may have you've got sixteen to six billion dollars, but maybe that revenue has been displaced into another 
market, in this case, virtual events. So I, I love that. I love that. Even like virtual training and things of that nature. So I know marketing people are scrambling now to try to figure out how do we reach these folks that we used to see face to face. I think that's the big challenge right now. Yeah. And, look, and this marketing money goes somewhere else. Five years ago, when I started the salesman podcast, <clears> or maybe six years ago now, I had to explain to people what a podcast is. Now every brand has mm -hmm. a podcast because the mm -hmm. the, the format, as, as obviously we're collaborating on this, is so useful because people will listen to it. They'll tune in for long periods of time. You're building that rapport with the presenter that you just can't get at a, uh, and you might push back on this, you know, being a, a you know a, a speaker as well. I would say you are going to, I don't know this for a fact. I would say though, from my own experience, listening to two or three hours of a podcast with an individual, I feel more rapport and trust with them than someone on a stage. Now, someone on a stage can perhaps have more of an impact on my life and change a parad give me a, perhaps a paradigm shift because you're in that environment and everyone around you is buzzing as well. So they're two different things. But if we can't do mm -hmm. one, the marketing money is being spent in other places as well. I think if I had a, cho if I had a choice to listen to somebody live and then listen to the recording, I would take the recording. That's how my, my brain has shifted, you know, because I want to rewind, listen to it again, you know, where sometimes I just get the quick hit of a, you know, that placebo to make me feel good. Like, yeah, I can do this. And then later on, reality hits. I goes, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And I can't go back and listen to that. So I, I love podcasts for that reason and video. So, okay. So next up, chorus, the AI launches quote, momentum and they sent us the press release so we appreciate that if you've got a press release that you'd like to send us a new update a new product a new service you can do that over at thisweekinsales.com so i'm going to paraphrase some of the uh, mm -hmm. press release here so what it allows you to do within your crm is it allows you to search for things like a decision by way, maker by the way I'm going to interrupt Will because he won't he won't read what he put in the show notes he won't read what he put in the show notes <laughs> I'm not going to read it, but it's like... I will it's, read it. It's kind of a lot of... I can hear you laughing. Ahead, I was, I'm just going to talk over him because I know what he's laughing at. And But now you've drawn attention to it. We want to be real here on This Week in Sales. I put, uh, Will, paraphrasing the bullshit in the press release because it's written by... <laughs> you know, it's not written for us. It was written you know, for, for media organizations. It's a lot of gobbledygook. Yeah, yeah, just a lot of gobbledygook. Go ahead. But we're going to get to the essence of it and so, pull out the real stuff. Yeah, we, you know, we're, we're going to do some, well, I'm going to try to do some of this translation for you. So this new update allows you uh, to search for things like a decision maker has been engaged, pricing has been discussed, or next steps discussed, things like this that Chorus to AI, can, AI can pull from a conversation and allows you to see all this within a CRM. Now, this allows sales leaders, which is what the, the update is really for, as opposed to individual salespeople. They can use all this data from a distance without having to ring up the salesperson and say, how did that call go? And how is this? And how is that? And they can see it across not just one salespeople, but multiple salespeople, the whole organization. They can see where the, the deals lie. So they can forecast potentially much more accurately from this. They can see where as a group, maybe uh, India, they're doing this. The US, they're doing this. Europe, they're doing this. And we can kind of translate this data across and improve best practices. So I think this is really exciting. I mean, this yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so I got two points of view on this one. Of course, people are not going to like me for a little bit, but I'm, an, I'm a course.ai fan. But one is, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's an announcement, so I, I get it. It's the marketing piece. We got to get an announcement out there. But also, I mean, how are you going to, they talk about see what was discussed. What do you mean by see what was discussed? Uh, you know, how do they, see, how do you get that information in there, Will, right? what was discussed. How is that information getting put into the CRM? So, and then how are they... So, I, I, so I'll explain. This is what's being automated. So for example, in Chorus.ai, if pricing is discussed within a conversation, that can then be tagged within that deal. That then can be shown that at a certain point in the sales process, pricing has been uh, discussed. And then they can use best practice of, we, can, we know across the whole organization now that when pricing is discussed at the beginning, things are good, things are bad. You can also then correlate uh, information from that of if we know that 50% of deals, if pricing is discussed up front, it's, a, it's going to be a success. So it, 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 we'll, we'll make that assumption. That might may or may not be true. Then they can look at across the whole um, uh, portfolio of deals that they have in the CRM and they can say, hey, look, these are likely to come in because we know what works, what doesn't. And it's just another data point as opposed to asking a sales professional to say, hey, 
is this likely to come in? Isn't it? Because every salesperson ever lies about what deals are coming in. They will lie at the beginning of the year that they've got no deals coming in because they want the sales target to be low. They will lie at the performance review at the end of the year because they want to look good in front of the, the sales manager. Yeah, in, no, in no, I, 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 I guess I'm also surprised. I guess, and by the way, I'm with you. I, I, I'm surprised that they didn't have this already. Can that be, my, that, that's probably my like, what? Didn't you have this already? You know, because I'm sure like Salesforce or some of these other CRM platforms have them. So this to me is saying, hey, we now have this. And maybe that's their big press release, you know, push. We now have this that we didn't have before. Because I think that should have been part of the platform already, right? I think the point is that it is automated. So your calls go in or you do your calls on the platform and then the CRM mm -hmm. knows whether this has happened as opposed to a salesperson moves a box along to say pricing is discussed or moves a box along to say or, or ticks a box um, in, in a framework that's been mm -hmm. within a CRM, it's it's yeah. almost more effective. Well, it is more effective than that, as long as the AI works, which we're assuming it does. That right. it's ha they pull it out of an organic conversation, as opposed to a salesperson having to click a box, which is more work, and then a salesperson forgetting to click the box, not yeah. understanding okay. what box okay. to click, and that side of things. Okay. And by the way, my apologies to Course.ai because I'm sure I'm reading I'm reading the press release and they're going, you don't understand, Victor. You're not really really understanding what we're trying to say. So I'm sure. This is a big move forward, or else they wouldn't have done this press release. So congratulations, course.ai. Sure. So check out the press release. Again, we'll have the link, and they'll probably articulate better than I could. We'll probably seem to have more, more of a handle on it than I do right now. Oh, look, and I'll be blunt. It's If we don't understand something, and I, I consider yourself much more of an expert in all of this than me, just by you know time and energy you've, you've spent in this sales space, right? Then it's not us that are that are wrong if we don't understand it and we can't communicate it it's not necessarily our fault is what i'm saying i don't want to blame I chorus either, but i'm going to blame chorus yeah <laughs> you're marketing Dear Matt. Go <laughs> so go ahead. Okay. go ahead we're going to get some feedback on this episode victor right i covered it last oh, we're week gonna, we're definitely gonna get a lot of feedback on this one so, i'm gonna uh, we're, we're just we're just trying to keep it real we're just trying to keep it real no, and that's important because uh, you know other yeah. shows shows done by organizations shows done by public organizations can't say half the stuff we've just said. So hopefully that comes across right. and that's valuable for the and, audience. And by the way, let, let, let's, let's take course an example. If we got this wrong, let us know where we got it wrong. Go to thisweekinsales.com. You know, tell us where we got it wrong and we're more than happy to correct you know, what we got wrong. That's that's Go a on. feature for the end of shows. Will and, and Victor got it wrong. We just, uh, yes. what do you call it? When it, it was, what's, yeah. it, what's it called when a newspaper gets something wrong and they, they redo something? It's called something. A retraction. It's a retraction. We can have it. We can, a, we can have retraction, retraction Wednesdays. Retraction Wednesday. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> so I covered this hey, last week on This Week in Sales, and I want to get Victor's thoughts on this because this is a huge topic, um, and I, I feel like I only scratched the surface of it last week, but we won't, we won't dwell on it. Salesforce has bought, it's happened. Salesforce has bought Slack. Victor, is there anything you want to add to this? Is there anything... Uh, that, that is super important for salespeople to know about this. I, you know, I was trying to understand the acquisition, right, of Slack. And again, smarter people up there know more than I do. But then, uh, and I forgot the article I was reading by a gentleman who I said called this like five years ago, that this was going to happen. Well, he didn't call it. He said, this is what Salesforce should do, buy Slack. And if they would have listened to that guy, they probably would have saved a lot of money. And he said, and I love the way he divided. He says, there is, he says view the CRM as a system of record where you keep all the contact information about the companies. But then Slack, because of all the engagement that happens on there, you view that as a system of engagement points. And so what I think has started to happen is that the CRM is becoming the system of record, almost like the nexus, the core. And we're building these engagement platforms around it to feed the CRM, the brain, so to speak. And that's where we're pulling all our information from. So I think this is just another bolt-on engagement data platform. Uh, that's going to feed into the CRM or vice versa. And I think it sounds like a good move. A lot of money though, man. A lot of money. I was reading today that sale, so it's hard, It's like 60% cash, 40% stock, which has been unusual for previous Salesforce acquisitions. They've been mainly stock in the past. And Salesforce don't have the, you know, it's a public company. We, we know uh, the financial records. They don't actually have enough cash in the bank to pay for the, the deal itself. So they've took on a, a one-year loan of billions of dollars 
to, uh, to to kind of fill the gap as well. So I don't know anything about this, but the article I was reading was saying is maybe this is they wanted to do it quick and they didn't they weren't quite set up for this. So maybe there's something going on in the background that we just don't know. And I know Salesforce's stock price uh, went down a little bit over the past few days since the acquisition, um, which is it's probably a good time to buy Salesforce stock right now. Not that Victor or I are. Um, I think was, we've got to say something about not being, uh, not yeah. giving professional not investment advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but we just—it's a thought. It's a thought you might want to consider. It's it's, hey, it's uh, smart, right? I, I, I want to move on to this book uh, that ties into GoConsensus.com. The book is called "Selling Is Hard, Buying Is Harder," and it was uh, by one of the, by the founder Garen Hess. And again, this book really explains why goconsensus.com again the intelligent you know um uh, demo automation uh piece is really important and i can't articulate why in, in you know in, in the short period of time but it is a powerful tool and again i love the fact that it can track who's viewed it how long they viewed it and uses analytics again i he used the phrase demolytics which i thought was clever demolytics to say we can use this data now to actually you know, know who's looking at our stuff. And maybe again, it'll help your champions and your mobilizers to sell more effectively. For sure. I will pick it up. I'm interested. I've had, uh, um, what's the chap's name? How rude of me. Uh, Garen. I've had Garen on the Salesman podcast before to talk about this, but it was years ago. So it'd be interesting to look back at that interview and then see what his thoughts are now with all the changes because clearly demos are only, or that online engagement anyway, are only going to become more and more important as we get to spend less and less time with buyers as the, the, the we talked about this before we click record on, on this week in sales, the buying cycle is getting with the sales elements of it is getting so, so crushed mm-hmm. that this is only going to become more and more important over time. Right. No, I got you. I got you. So let's go to the next topic. Well, I want to jump to, do you mind? Well, let's go to the no deal Brexit on the culture piece. Cause I, I want to know, talk, talk to me about that right there. So, uh, this is going to shift over the next few days because good old Boris, Boris the legend, I absolutely love him. Not anything to do with his politics. I just want to go to the pub with him and spend some time with him because he's hilarious. Well, he's now travelled to uh, to Europe. I think he's in Brussels right now to try and get this on track because, and people in the UK, I don't know about elsewhere in the world where it's been reported. I don't know about Europe especially and their opinions on UK as they come out of, uh, out of Europe. Um, in the UK, it's just been totally underreported and nobody cares. But... There are some consequences to this. So I'm going to quote here, quote, there are very large gaps or very large gaps remain even between the UK and the EU, despite a meeting between good old Boris Johnson and EU chief Urs- Ursula von der Leyen. I'm probably butchering that. Um, and they're trying to break this deadlock uh, between the, the two the two sides. Now, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to read from the doc as well. It says Victor liked this last time. I put, there's real shit on the line. In a no-deal scenario, the EU is having to put new plans into place that include allowing aviation safety certificates to continue to avoid the grounding of aircraft. So if they didn't put all these kind of temporary measures in place, this is how uh, important this has started to become, that planes flying from the UK into Europe, there's no, there will be no standardization of what these planes need to do, be, have, uh, you know, be maintained at. And so it seems like somewhat flippant of, oh, we're coming out of Brexit. Well, we've got the pound. We don't need the euro. Well, there's, there's, there's real consequences to all this. And uh, another quote here, a no deal would mean tariffs and quotas on imports and exports that will increase the prices here in the UK, increase the, increase the prices of cars by 10% and some foodstuffs such as the all important cheese and beef by 50% or more. <laughs> so people will go to the shops in a few weeks from ta- a few weeks from now and they'll try and pick up I think brie is french they'll try and pick up brie and it's going to be 50% more they're going to get some uh, the uk does i think the uk does lots of sheep but doesn't do a lot of um beef i think beef is imported from europe so beef is you're going to you're going to get a burger you're going to go to a restaurant and the the burger's going to be 3 quid 4 quid more expensive so it's going to have a real impact on people and this is just the the scratching surface of what it may have on wow. sales people especially if you're selling in or out of Europe this could be a topic for a few yeah, weeks time is, when all this wow. really lands yeah i mean layer layer this in with your lockdown and all the stuff that's happening there i mean how's the mood over there by the way uh fine 
uh, in the UK, we don't have, and I, I, again, this is I don't want to talk about the politics of things too much, but everything isn't politicized like it is uh, elsewhere in the world, in America. Mm-hmm. And so the yeah. lockdown is is what it is. It's now ended. Now we're in this tiered system. Um, over Christmas, um, you you can you mix with so many families, so many pe- different households and stuff. Um, and the UK was the and you know to counterbalance that, the UK was the first to give a in the world uh, the the uh, a vaccine the other day. I think it was a few days ago. It was Monday. We're recording this on um, on Thursday, and so we're rolling out the vaccine. A crap ton of it's been bought and within the next few weeks or so, a huge percentage of people over 90 in the UK will have had the first dose. You need multiple doses, but the first dose of the vaccine. So, you know, it swings around about how you how you want to look at things. Uh, but I'd say, and I'm somewhat insulated from this. Uh, regular listeners will know that my partner is an NHS uh, geriatrician. She's a, a elderly medicine doctor. So I get one side direct from her of what's going on within the, within the hospitals. And I'm insulated because I record with you, Victor. I record with other people. And then I go, home. I, I'm not, you know, if I was working in a large factory that had been closed down because of COVID and you now there's we're all sat with screens in between us, uh, my thoughts and opinions might be different. But I would say that the mood is is fine. Okay. Okay. Well, let me tell you about the mood in California. <laughs> How's that for a segue? Let me tell you about the mood in California. <laughs> it's not good. Elon Musk, this is our, by the way, this is, we've entered our culture section. We'll wrap up here. Uh, Elon Musk is moving to Texas. Elon Musk has, is abandoning his long-term home base in California, relocating to Texas. Uh, the Tesla chief executive is the most high-profile tech executive to leave Silicon Valley amid the pandemic. Musk plans to relocate coincides with the construction of a new Tesla factory in the Lone Star State. Now, Joe Rogan also left California. So people are leaving California. You know, they're, they're it's just a little expensive over there, if you know what I mean. And so, you know, you're starting to see, by the way, we're here in Atlanta, Georgia. We're starting to see a lot of people coming from New York and New Jersey, expensive states, coming to live in Georgia where we're more reasonable. Problem is, they're bringing their voting habits with them. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, I, I, I really, I don't even know what that means. So that's, that's how ignorant <laughs> I am to that. And, you know, from our perspective, we, I don't know whether we, we're going to see less migration from Europe into the UK, from the UK into Europe. What people don't realize mm. with a lot of this stuff is that you may, uh, the stereotype in the UK is that lower paid workers are coming. This is not true. The data does not show this. Low paid workers are coming from the U, uh, from the EU into the UK and taking our jobs. That is not, there is no evidence of this. The, the data is pretty clear. Um, on on jobs and uh, and and you, you, there's, there's there's issues with we've got a lack of nurses in the, the NHS and a huge percentage of nurses come from abroad to come to the, the UK in the NHS. Um, I think you might call it socialised healthcare. We would probably put a different uh, spin on things. And I'm super proud of the NHS. I, I I love it. It's incredible. It's it's served me and my family well when we've needed it. And we need nurses from from other places. There's a lot of uh, Malaysian nurses and 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 and, play, and and there's lots lots of doctors and surgeons from um, that are well trained from from even India and um, Australia and all these different places. And they come to the UK because of the facilities that we have and uh, and and because of the NHS. Now, all of this starts getting all weird when we say and we make assumptions. And and you know it works for sales as well. Maybe you want to go and work for one company. Maybe you want to sell from one place to another. Um, everything that we do over at Salesman.org, we charge in dollars because the dollar has been you know, the most stable currency uh, and it does well against the pound. And so selling in dollars works for us uh, when it's translated into my own bank account at the end of the day, the, the little that's left, right? And all of this is just incredibly complicated. And I feel like we're going to go through a few years now with, um, with political turmoil, potentially in the US, rightly or wrongly, depending on what side you're on or different things, with Brexit in the UK. Um, and, and that affects clearly Europe as well, because the, the UK, London is a financial hub in Europe. So that affects trading on on, on commodities and other things uh, throughout Europe as well. It's going to be, I don't know if the word is interesting. I don't, I'm, I'm struggling to find the word here, but... Let, let, me, let me summarize what you're saying. Sure. It's going to be a real shite show for a <laughs> while over there. So you get your stuff together. Well, look, they, a lot of stuff have to... It's hard. It's hard. It's, this is, by the way, you know, to break apart from a union, it's very hard. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy to do, easy to get emotional about. 
But then the actual details of how this thing is going to roll out is just a nightmare. And the people in charge are also guessing at it. You know, that would be my assumption because they're, they're trying to figure it out. I mean, on this side of the pond, whoever is certified as president, uh, you know, I think that the economy would be strong enough, you know, and it'll go forward. It's not Armageddon either way. You know, I think there's exaggerations from both sides. So I, I say, I say, let's make a decision. Let's move forward. Let's figure this thing out. Hey, let's celebrate the fact that there is a vaccine, even if it comes in multiple stages. This is upside. I don't know. I want, I want to end on an up note here, man. That's upside right there. So, yay. What a way to wrap up. <laughs> we'll wrap up the show with that. I want to thank everyone for listening, everyone for tuning in on uh, Vintage YouTube channel, the Selfman to Org YouTube channel, the uh, everywhere that this is getting spread around. There's loads of good feedback on LinkedIn. We appreciate it. Feel free to share the show, uh, whether it's coming from uh, video side, my side, whatever it is, uh, that's massively appreciated as well. The bigger the show gets, the more uh, press releases we get and the better content we can put together for you. And so from me, from Victor, well, thank you again for joining us on This Week in Sales.